Sharia law and also the Islamic doctrines of a whole to them, whole to them because their intention was to turn the, Islam, the whole country into an Islamic state. For instance, there was no good, there was no representation of uh, people in the South in the central government. There were no schools that were built in the South. The few schools that were built in so many places were only men for teaching Islamic doctrine. Uh, some people could not go there because they did not want to uh, their face in God uh, in, in Christ and then became Muslim. So what happened is, is hospitals were not built, roads were not built, uh, resources were not shared equally. So over the years, people in the South have been so resistant against the people in the North and they've been trying to voice out their complaints. So what the government of, Sudan, of, of, of the North decided at the time when we got out of the country in 1987 was to get all people in the South and there was a meeting at some point, at some point there was a meeting in the Middle East as we were told that uh, they wanted to turn the South Sudan as an, as an agricultural uh, production area because the land is so fertile and if there's a way for Southern Sudanese to be put out in neighboring countries then this place can be used for agricultural production. So there was a meeting at, the, at, at some point when we were told. So when the, when the government sent military and military forces to the south, the intention was to get up all the people in the villages to kill them. For instance, they would just kill, they would kill old people, you know, you could imagine. They kill young kids and they would take them for slavery. as been practiced for years like that. So that was the intention. And I was at a kind of camp in care of my, of my, of my, my dad's, my family's cows, you know, never thought something like that would happen. So their intention was to get rid of people in, in, in the South. Their intention was to get rid of them. And um, I would give an example of one of the one of the lost boys uh, when we ran out of the country in 1991. I was a wonderful Christian. He had a Bible with him, and he got caught along with other kids. So it was hard whether he was a Christian or not. And he told this guy, this soldier, "Yes, I'm a Christian." And he told, "Are you a Christian?" And he said, "Yes, I'm a Christian." And, and he cut off the hand that he was holding the Bible uh, with a big knife on the gun, cut off his hand. And the, guy was, the boy was crying and insisted, are you a Christian? He said, yes, I'm a Christian. And he stuck his stomach with the knife and cut him to death. Some of the boys were like, oh yeah, we are not Christians. So they were taken to Khartoum. And then later when they were interviewed, they, they told the story of one of, the, one of the brothers who got killed because he did not denounce that he was in God. So many places, for instance, in, in, in South Sudan, there happened in so many places in the South where people were, were captured and they were housed whether they're Christians. And if they, if they said, yes, we are Christians, they would get that killed. I will give an example of a tribe called Wudu in South Sudan. Uh, it was back in 1996 when the rebels came to that village. And they got the villagers and the leaders in that village together and they, tell, they told them, today, you are, if you are not going to change your mind, from believing in Jesus Christ, from believing in that God, and becomes Muslim, you will see. People refused. Well, they got out these uh, five, I think five or six leaders in front of the gathered villages, and they killed them right over there, in front of them. And they would ask people who are sitting down, if you are, if you are Christians, then you are going to die like this individuals as well. People refused, and they would get people in lines, you know, would get people in lines, and would ask you, if you are a Christian, if, if you say yes, I'm a Christian, they will take three, three inch nail, three inch nail, with a hammer, and drive that on the power of your head, or maybe put them inside the heart, and will drive this Soviet, uh, Soviet uh, Union uh, tank, the war tank, over the heart and keep people inside there. So many places people were drawn, thrown into the dry wells. Pastors, people were drawn, thrown into dry wells. In 19, uh, uh, back in 1990s, a pastor from South Sudan went to Khartoum to encourage Christians who are subjected to persecution. You know, he would travel so many places in the cartoon, which is the capital city of Sudan, or of old Sudan, and he was captured because it was it was reported that you know, it, was, it was it was reported that this, this pastor was involved in politics, but it was not in, it was not politics. It was encouraging Christians in, in the north not to be not to be very, very very strong in their face, not to be to stand uh, firmly in their face. That was his message. Providing hope about God. He was captured, put in jail, later he was released in a few days, came back to his house, and then the people came to his house, got him and his wife and children, you know, put him inside, locked the door, and set the house on fire and burned him alive. So there are so many instances. You know, one of the boys who was captured in, in the South itself has been interviewed um, and is now alive. When when he was captured, he was 13 years old, 
and you know, the little kid was killed, and the hit was cut off, and he was told to carry that hit for five days, and when the hit became, began to decompose, you know, it was told by these neighbors to throw on the side of the road and put it on fire, you know, and it was taken to slavery in Khartoum. He said, what happened to him in that time, when he was carrying the hit of a little boy, was so devastating to him, absolutely to the maximum, than when he was a slave in Khartoum. So there are so many things that were not disclosed that happened to so many Christians in the South, in South Sudan. So that what happened, to answer your question, people in the South, because the government wanted to turn the country to Islamic state. What is the survival rate of the boys who were unfortunately forced to become soldiers? Uh, uh, well, especially what happened, uh, the survival, if I can get the question right, the survival rate of boys who became soldiers yeah, what happened, I, I, uh, I would give some examples. What happened, especially for some of the kids who were captured in the South during the Civil, during the civil War, um, they were turned by the government of the North as soldiers. Some of them would be like 11 or 12 years, uh, if they were able to carry a gun. And these kids were brought back, and at the gun point, they would fight the people, you know, would kill them, they would fight back. Some of them sometimes, some of the kids would kill themselves because they didn't you know, want to, uh, to kill their, their relatives or maybe their people, you know, that's what happened. But some of the kids were taken to slavery. Um, there's a guy who was taken to slavery for over 10 years and he escaped from slavery. And, um, and he came to this country and wrote a book and he's been talking about the country. Uh, who were through the help of, 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 of Christians when he got out of that, of, of that slavery. Uh, <coughs> He was the last one to go to bed. He was the last one to get up. He was the first one to get up in the morning to take care of his master's cattle. And he was subjected to so many suffering. Uh, sometimes he would, he would be told not to look into the eye of his master's wife, you know, because he was considered uh, a beat, which is a slave, a black slave. You know, he was not, he was not that, uh, was not that great. Um, so he came to this country. So, so, so many kids were taken uh, and used as child soldiers, so but some 11, 10. Uh, and, and more. That's what happened. But unfortunately, uh, some of them did not survive, did not make it, um, they lost their lives, for, inst yeah, for instance. But the government of the, the South uh, was so determined that uh, the freedom is, is provided. If I could answer your question. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, well, there's, there's, yeah, there are uh, barbaric statistics. At first, we talk of 20,000 lost boys to begin with, and later when we went to a larger scale, we had so many kids who came to Ethiopia at the time. So the number went into about 30, um, uh, based on the uh, later statistics. But by the time we left the country in, in 1992, back to, uh, to Sudan and to Kenya in 1991, and then to Sudan to Kenya in 1992. Uh, the United Nations took the statistics and they found that out of 20,000 North boys and North girls, uh, uh, 12,000 of them survived, 8,000 lost their lives along the way, and that was how they really can. Uh, so by the time we were interviewed to come to this country, uh, I think about 4,000 of us came to this country, and so many of the boys and girls went to a different country like uh, Australia, uh, some went to Europe because the story became well known to the whole world, and that they wanted to have these boys and girls. So, so the number, now number is, is different, but we still have some of the boys back now, uh, some of the that are now big adults, you know, they're back now in South Sudan and there are so many places. Yeah. So the number is, is different, yeah. Oh yes, yeah, I started my education when I was in Africa. I had my high school uh, completed in, in, uh, in, in Kampuma Refugee Camp in Kenya, and then I came to this country. I had my undergraduate studies at Southern Western University. And then I went to a theology school and graduated um, uh, this past May, three classes in December, and then graduated this May. And then I studied at the PA school at South University down here. And my goal is to go back to my country, so it has been a long journey, uh, you know, journey which has been part of my life because I know it's been so many, in fact, so many people's uh, life in a variety of ways. I have read that under the UN Resolution 
Uh, to be honest, I don't know when it, but I've never heard of that, um, uh, that, that story that had happened. And I don't know of any specific country or any country that would deny uh, it would to be considered problems in case people lose their, their parents or to go to where they can have a lot of opportunities. I don't know. We have a few girls, a few lost girls with us. And when the opportunity came, it was such, it was such a blessing to all of us to came to this country. But for us, you know, normally, uh, because there has been three generations, uh, girls normally get married earlier. You know, they get for them to go to school, they get married earlier, and continue the family, uh, family line. So that, that's the that's goal there. And, and, and education at first was not, uh, was not provided because of, of, of the government itself. But now what happens, uh, we have, um, uh, you know, there are a lot of opportunities where girls are coming to school, but because of responsibilities, and, and, the, and, and, the, and the expectations that people have from girls with this problem. But coming this country was a problem for us, uh, I think, uh, for those countries that deny girls because they often I think it's not right. It had to do with the culture of the family and the culture of the No, I, I don't know. I think that's, I think that's, um, I think that's, it, um, we'll put that information there. I think we don't, we have, we have never heard of that. Because, uh, the refugee camp, what happened with us, uh, normally when the families later came, uh, they would have their families come and stay with us. Uh, but when the refugee camp came, they were not allowed to stay with the parents. Uh, they were forced into the families, the needs families. Normally the girls stay with the parents, or maybe the relatives. But when we were by ourselves, these girls stayed with their cousin. And later when we had a uh, Sudanese family who came, uh, based on that tradition, these girls were forced into the families, and some of them were married. And uh, later when uh, some of them were not married at the time, uh, was, uh, applied, you know, they were, okay, we are lost girls, and their names were there in the list. So they were interviewed and came to this country. But for instance, I have my cousin now, uh, he's in Michigan, who was one of the lost girls at the time. And, uh, and uh, he's been found in Nagar, Sudan, because he's completely established. So a lot of, we have few girls who came to this country, but the majority of the boys, we are the majority, and that's why we got the name Lost Boys. That's the name Lost Boys, because we are the majority, and it was not given out by the African Nation uh, workers that um, they had to be given the name Lost Boys, but we have a few girls, and that's why the name Lost Boys became so much dominant. And the reason why we had only a few girls compared to, uh, to so many boys, you know, traditionally, when you go to the Garo camp, it was mainly the boys, it's mainly the boys who take care of the cow. But if your dad doesn't have a son, and he has a daughter who is old enough that he can go to the cow and take care of the cows. You know, and that's a period of three months, you know, take care of them until the rains come. You know, it's about uh, maybe about 30 miles or maybe 40 miles, more than that. You stay there for three months without seeing your parents, and they will remain in the, in the village to take care of that of the farm. They would be doing farming, you know, some, some building, you know, uh, cutting down trees and make some houses. That's how we live traditional way of life like that. So if, you, if, you, if, you, if your dad doesn't have a son to take care of the cows, then you are likely to go to the cow camp and take care of the cows. So that's why we ended up with few girls. And uh, some of the girls later ran away with the, with the parents as in the villages. So that's what happened. Yeah, so yes, that's a very wonderful question. <laughs> um, yes, this evangelist called Barnabas is now in Australia. Uh, he became my spiritual mentor at the time, and uh, would give us scriptures from the Bible, and would give me uh, stories of, of, of uh, people of faith in the Bible. And, uh, and he told me not to pray to God, and to pray to God, and to give myself to God, and not to be distant, not to be questioning God. So when I gave myself to God at the, uh, at the time, I saw many things happening to me, uh, dreaming I'd been in, such, in different places. Um, where I met people that I never met before. Sometimes I would, I would be like, okay, this is what it is, what it is, what it dreams. And um, I was having, uh, you know, having good life. I, I never thought I would have that. These dreams I would share with some of the 
some of my cousins and friends, and this is dangerous. And uh, over time, Bible became part of my life. It's become part of my life. I will read the Bible all the time and be very faithful. I know when I leave this world, if I die, as, as my cousins and friends who have died, then I'm going to live with them. Since I didn't know about my family, I told them who did. My family, is, my, all my family members were dead. I was like, I'm going to meet them, you know. So for me, um, I was like, I give myself to God no matter what, what happens. So over the years, I see God's hands over me and, and how he, that's how I became um, a, a, a devout Christian. I began a devout Christian, yes. Um, yeah, now we split into two countries. Um, now we are two countries, the north and the south. But still, we have so much of, uh, issues that need to be resolved. Um, especially the border demarcation is not very clear. We don't have the border demarcation between the north and the south. And also with the new nation with uh, limited uh, uh, manpower. Uh, it's very difficult with a lot of resources. It's very difficult for government in the north let the SARS go and be free, be a free state, because they have all the resources. I want the number to do, they use some other people in, in the SARS, in different tribes, you know, to, to cause insta you know, instability in the SARS itself. A lot of you know, people being killed most of the time in so many places, you know, development going on. And um, the government in the north, you know, has a lot of a lot of a lot of a lot of charges on oil being according to the north because we don't have a pipeline. So that's the major problem now. The power lines that takes oil from the south goes to the north. That's what they're there for. So they know by telling us not to, you know, they want us all the time. They want us, they don't want us to leave. That's the main goal. And if you try to tell them, okay, we have to do this, sometimes they, they will not listen. Um, so the situation in the, in the south now is not all that stable. Uh, but we are working, we are working toward that. We are working with the United States, we are working with the United Nations and some other countries. But um, uh, but the, I think the only reason why the problem will be provided with is when we have a special, when we have a water demarcation between the north and the south, and we have our own pipeline. Yeah, but it's still difficult now. Okay, so last one. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good. It's more of a politics. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, actually, I see a lot of um, Muslims in this country. Uh, I would not say all oh, Muslims are really bad, but for uh, an individual who has been in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Africa and in a country where Islam is taken. Uh, Differently because of the belief of in Sharia, what you call a jihad war, and um, I would say the growing of Islam in this country um, is is quite difficult. You know, it's quite difficult to answer because it's quite difficult to answer. But not all Muslims are really bad. But the um, but there are few radical Islam Islamists there. I uh, will try to make things worse most of the time. But my concern is the whole world because it's, Islam is now spreading all over the world. Now it's now increasing. People are, are are going to Islam. Are going to Islam. They want to be Muslim. They want to be Muslims. And I think this is a major problem um, for the most part. But one other thing that people need to know too about is, is, is Islam. Um, you know, it, it's very difficult for the most part. I would say this. Um, I was with some of the Muslims and uh, in in Africa. And um, and if you tell them about your, your faith in God, they will not believe that. They will never believe that. And if you tell them the reality about their faith, about, about their God, the God that they believe, that God does, who is that God, who wants to kill the other people, you know, that, the kid, the other kids, you know, small kids, all adults, elderly, who is that God? Who is that God who lives in jihad war, kill other people because of my name? You know, I don't think that is right. And also to go to eternal life, which is only through Jesus Christ, you know, through Muhammad, you know. But you know, it, you know, it breaks my heart when I see people going into this, into this, into this religion. I believe that I go to eternal life because I know that's you know, that's not the way, uh, the way through Jesus Christ. So.
So the grown ups from this country, if you are not paying attention, you never know maybe 20 years, 10 years, how many people, how many Muslims are going to be in this country? How many Muslims are going to be in the world? How what is the nature of the how is the world going to look like at the time? You know, when the uh, majority of people are becoming are becoming Muslims at the time. So that's my concern. Uh, but in terms of politics, uh, what I denounce about that, and I, I say strongly, is the belief that, okay, we need to kill other people. You know, for instance, they have what is called honor killing, you know. When somebody has committed a crime, that should be killed, that should be stoned to death, you know. And if you go and kill the other people that, for the name of God, then you are going to go to paradise. Uh, this is totally, totally wrong. This is totally wrong. So we have to teach our people about about Islam, you know, we need to teach about, about Islam. Um, Islam, what Islam is, you know, and what their doctrine, you know, okay, what their doctrine is. And um, that's what we will need to keep our country strong. Otherwise, uh, if we don't emphasize that and tell them about who God that we believe, God of Jesus Christ, uh, then people are going to turn to Islam. with our 